just uh, I'm just going to very quickly go through um, why we're talking about NAP10 and then run through the agenda and kick off an icebreaker. Um, and I know there's a lot of people, so we're going to do the fastest icebreaker in the history of icebreaking. Then we're going to go through a couple of quick fire feedback rounds, and then we're going to get a really big feedback round from you. We've put aside almost an, a, a half of the meeting to get a huge bulk of feedback from you. Um, and then we're going to ask you one thing that we could change. So that's kind of how it's going to flow. So this is a little story of NAPTAN and why I think as a service designer, it's really important. So this is a little story of a council worker moves a bus stop due to roadworks around a corner. I can't draw a map, so I just had to write the word corner sideways in there. Sorry about that. Trying to trying to draw a 3D world. Um, and a blind bus traveler sits down at a bus stop, sits down in the usual spot, and somebody comes past and says, er, mate, the bus stop's closed. It's, it's now somewhere else. And of course, they didn't know because they weren't able to get that information. And this is where NAP10, the vision comes in of like the council worker emails through to somebody like yourselves, the, the LTA data administrators, it, using some kind of te technology magic, they can update a website or update something that says this bus stop has moved and it's going to move for the next six weeks. Um, you can do things like only change one bus stop. You can set a start and stop end date for a small move. This goes into NAPTAN, which is solid gold data. We're talking disco quality, solid gold, blinging data. Um, that is really brilliant that the bus operators can get so they can move their schedule, that a software company can get so they can update their app and they update their software with all the latest changes and that happens as many times as those changes come through. And a blind user gets told by their app because their screens get read to them, bus stop XY has moved around the corner and they go to the right bus stop and catch their bus. So that's kind of NAPTAN and its vision. So we're in the process of trying to figure out if we can make this happen. And one of the reasons for this kind of session is to get a lot of feedback from you all as uploaders, really trying to understand what your world is like and does this vision fit as a service designer, which is what my role is. Um, does this make sense to your world? What are the things that I need to change to make this make more sense? How do we make this this data solid gold data how do we make this the bling, most blinging disco solid gold data because naptan is the key to pretty much everything to do with buses that happens throughout dft um, without naptan we we would have timetables that don't have buses and all uh, don't have bus stops and all that sort of thing so this is the agenda for today so we're going to quickly do an icebreaker find out who you all are get you talking a little bit we're going to run through what is a bus stop, and that may sound really obvious, but we want to understand what a bus stop actually means to everybody. Um, going to talk a little bit about accessibility, talk a little bit about uploading files, then we're going to go into that gold, solid gold data about data checking and data correction and try and understand your current processes and how we can make that better in the future. And then we're going to ask you if we could fix one thing, what would that one thing be? Kind of the reverse of the Apple one more thing, we're going to do it in the reverse way. Now, I'm going to keep sharing my screen, but I'm going to ask you to be interactive in a few minutes. So, thank you all for, for taking part in that tiny bit of chaos. Um, so now to introduce a little bit more chaos, because that is what I do. Um, um, my job title, by the way, is Harbinger of Change. Uh, it should be Harbinger, it should be Chaos Monkey, but it's kind of, uh, I got to write my own job title, so why not be fabulous? So what I want to move on to is this question of what is a bus stop? And we might all say this is blindingly obvious and why are we asking this question? But it's not when you think about it because a bus stop can be um, a physical bus stop that's on a street or a logical bus stop that's in uh, in a network, in a diagram, on a map, in a in a schedule, in a route. Um, but I kind of this is how I'm seeing it. So uh, a physical box, a physical bus stop, is created by new construction. It's got accessibility information that can be updated, um, and roadworks can change or remove it. 
and for a logical bus stop you've got route planning which has your travel time has the transfer time of that bus stop and also has the mapping and as at data administrators we're kind of working with both of those now i'm going to give you a link and i'm just going to grab it here hopefully really easily um and then, well because i know that this recording goes out so i'm just going to put the link into the chat when i can get to the chat the chat will randomly reappear for me the chat will reappear for me and i will be able to figure out where the chat has gone I think the I, chat I get... is only available to whoever set up the meeting. Yeah, I was wondering where the chat was. Apologies, Jay. I guess we'll share that over. Um, perhaps if you just send that to Tim. Could so yes. Um, yeah. In, in the problem is in in Teams, if um, uh, if you're all external to the organisation, um then uh, it isn't available yet. Yeah, send it to me on an email and I'll put it into chat so people can see it. Fantastic. I will just quickly do that now, but give me 30 seconds to quickly do this. Um, I'll just use the same one, Tim, that you sent me there. I need to send them that and the password. Uh, you know what it's like when you try to do something fast and your fingers decide not to work. And I'll just... We need to put in the password NAPTAN uploaders. Word uh, N A P T A N hyphen uploaders, or one word. If you could just put that into the chat, that would be so useful. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can see it. If not, this is going to be interesting to get you the link that I very carefully set up so that we could do this, so that you could all use wonderful technologies and we could share what we're doing in a fast and effective way to get through a lot of the stuff today. As a backup, if you quickly send me the link, I can create a shorter version of it. Um, uh, just in case I, shall, uh, I shall do that. Thank you. That, it's in chat, so hopefully you should people should be able to see it now can you see no i don't can't know see chat. Can't you can't chat. see chat at can't all open chat right uh, i'm just going to quickly send no. this to ben who is going to make me a short bitly link hopefully or something similar i'm just sending it on teams ben yeah that's fine done it's in your it's in your box Do, 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 do. Copy that. Do, 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 do. Best laid plans of mice, it. men, and people, and people trying to do this. So while we do this, actually, I can get people's verbal feedback on this um, while people try and join. So, do you, people agree or disagree with this with this notion of what is a bus stop? Does this the way that I've spelt it out make sense? People must have an opinion on this group. I can't believe nobody's got an opinion here. I think I think what you said does sum it up quite nicely, but it sums up one version of a bus stop. Um, I'm not the only person here that will be representing rural counties, but we have an awful lot of custom and practice bus stops that might just be recognisable by a little bit of patch patch of grass that's been worn away on the side of a road where people might get picked up. And I guess the other thing I was thinking about is stop areas that you might want to use for demand responsive transport. Not that I've actually ever used them, but um, I do use NAPTANs to represent an area for demand responsive transport as well. So, so, so let me just grab that. So rural bus stops are less physically obvious. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just going to use that as a, a, a as a piece. But also you said, and I didn't quite get the bus stop area. Could you help me understand that a little bit more? Yeah, so we have some in our rural areas, we have demand responsive transport um, that will literally take you between any particular place in any of the areas that it operates. Um, and I know in NAPTAN there are, um, you can have a stop area to use for them. I personally don't use them. Um, I do use regular NAPTAN stops to represent an area. Um, say like I might just use one central stop to represent an area. Um, that's being served but um, I think it's quite 
yeah, I don't, I don't know how that's going to be handled going forwards, I guess. Thank you. That makes sense, or that helps me make sense of another yep. type of physicality. So, Tricia, you had your hand up. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to add the stop areas are called flexible zones. So uh, they're classed as FLX types. Um, so we use them in Nottinghamshire for some. Um, we've got um, semi demand responsive where it goes to certain villages and will divert to other villages if it's pre booked in advance. Um, obviously, you also have hail and ride stops um, again where you have stretches of road that are rural. Um, that may not have anything physical, but you can hail, hail and ride the bus along that stretch. Um, we also have what we call both ways bus stops. So in some of our smaller villages where we don't want too much, where they where the villagers don't really want too much clutter in the village, we would create we create a marked point on one side of the road and call it both ways. And the other side is more of a custom and practice, um, but ne not necessarily physically marked by anything. Um, but it still has the ability to display a timetable for both sides of the road with it having a marked point on one side. That makes tons of sense. I think I'm, I'm, I, I'm in New Zealand, I was a suburban kid. Um, here, I'm a city person. I don't think I've ever actually been, I've been in the countryside, but never caught a bus in the countryside. Um, so I'm understanding there's a whole world that I don't know. Roger, you have had your hand up. Hi. Um, yeah, I don't think I agree with the um, the, the physical and logical um, categories there. I don't think that you can really separate the two. Um, as, as people have said, we we as a rural authority, we have a lot of custom and practice stops. Hail and ride typically isn't marked in rural areas. Um, flexible zones never are. Um, we tend to treat the logical stops as a superset of the physical stops. There is a danger to completely separating the two. I know that some authorities um, have a tendency if a physical stop is not in use to take it out of nap 10. In other words, it's physically there, but it's not logically there. The um, thing about that is that you need to be very, very careful about um, how you manage that. Otherwise, there's a tendency when the stop is eventually reinstated, if it is eventually reinstated, to end up creating a second logical stop rather than reactivating the first one. Um, so our general principle is that um, if it is served by a bus, it is a bus stop, whether it's physically present or not, that is your logical stop. Um, if it's physically present, but it isn't served, it's still a bus stop. Right. Um, otherwise, the management becomes um, a nightmare. Um, so completely separating the two concepts is not a good idea i feel others may disagree with me that's a that's a really good uh viewpoint thank you uh jared i think you've had your hand up Just giving Jared a second to figure out he's on mute. Uh, does anyone else have? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear you actually. Didn't hear. You oh, the name. Sorry. Properly. Um, I think I don't know if this is actually relevant or not, but I would see bus stops not in isolation in some cases, but as part of a wider transport network. So bus stops are sometimes grouped into bus stations, and they're also important about effective interchange, not only between between different bus services but between different modes and I know we're sort of primarily talking about bus stops but I would think that's a, that's an important factor to uh, take into account as well so I've got no problem with the definition I'm just sort of broadening it slightly I I, I like that and I heartily agree um, and I think what I'm sensing is there's a real difference between how somebody within a city sees a bus stop within a, a very urban environment and somebody in a more rural environment sees bus stops um, and the practices that are around those bus stops because I don't think there are hail and ride sections in in TFL. I don't think there no, are. Uh, there are, with respect, quite several of them in, in housing oh. areas. It's, sorry, I didn't want to contradict you for the sake of it, but... Um, no, no, it's you fine. You did make the point. It's normally... 
often in London, what happens is that we have to have a consultation process. And I don't know if this is the case outside London. I don't think it is, but the statutory consultation. So you get the nimbyism, or not in my backyard, of people who seem to think that, you know, there shouldn't be bus services in their area because they don't want them. So often it's a compromise not to have fixed stops, but actually to have hail and ride arrangements. So they are relatively common in London um, on the fringes, as, you, as you'd expect. Um, and a little bit difficult for us to actually cater for in some cases. But yes, they do exist. So I'm all too familiar with them. <laughs> Thank Mark you. Had, I... Mark had his hand up next. Roger, I think your hand's up for the previous comment. That's correct. Um, so I have got uh, yes, John I've, sorry, and Mark. My hand is yeah. not up at the moment. Yeah. So um, I've got Mark and then John. Oh, I apologise. My I apologise. My hand hit that um, that little hand <laughs> symbol. I do. I do. Everything that I was going to say has been covered. So move on. Fantastic. And uh, John McCabe, I think you're you've got your hand up yeah uh, sorry uh, forgive me if this has already been covered but i'm not under understanding what the aim is with this it, what you're trying to achieve by asking what a bus stop is i mean all this information is like already available in the naptan scheme what a bus stop is what flexible areas hill and ride areas light rail and things like that so i feel like all we're talking about is the schema that's already been published are we tr are we looking to actually change the schema I'm not looking to change the schema. I'm looking to really understand how, Jeez. what the words are, how they actually match reality, how they work. I'm a service designer, so I'm trying to help us understand what NAPTAN does and what it serves. Um, for, and sorry, really, for really what get... final, for what For what purpose? What is the, what are you looking to do at the final part? Are you looking to change the, sorry, my understanding was you were looking to update the national NAPTAN database where all everybody feeds into and this just seems a lot broader that we're actually talking about bus stops and things like that um, sorry I don't mean I'm not trying to come across as an arse or anything like that I'm just trying to understand oh, no, what, no. what the purpose is you're not coming across as an ass at all don't worry about it not yet it's, <laughs> <laughs> um it's trying so as part of the NAPTAN refresh is trying part of making it better, building that solid gold data. Understanding what data represents is really, really important. That's why understanding this has really helped me understand the difference between a bus stop and a flexi ride and a hail and ride and what the what the hail and ride areas are and things like that. Trying to get those different perspectives because even reading the document tells me something but doesn't really help me understand and hearing it from you, hearing you describe what you're talking about actually really helps us get into what NAPTAN should be doing and how it we should look at helping you do better and helping you serve the users of this data better. So that's that's my goal. D does that make sense? And please don't feel unasked for asking that question because it was a really good question. It makes sense to a purpose, but you, I think you're looking at a vastly bigger project than what's actually being, what, what's actually going to be delivered, isn't it? Yeah. I think because there's so many inputs, so many local authorities in, inputting this data and everybody's doing it as per the NAPTAN scheme uh, to actually try and figure out if everybody's doing it correctly, it's, it's quite a big ask. And that is a big ask and that is something that we're going to touch on because it's about understanding if we can do something with the software that makes it easier for you to be more corrector. Right. Sorry. Easier for you to get the data right, to be more consistent because we want solid gold data. But if the data in West Yorkshire is slightly different to the data in West Midlands, and I don't know if those are different places. I don't know Britain well enough. Um, but if those two places are using the same words in a slightly different way, we want to understand and find a way to kind of get everyone using the data 
the same way so that the data is solid. And when somebody says this is a hail and ride, we understand exactly what it means. When somebody says it's a bus stop, we know that for an urban area, it means this furniture and a seat and a pole and all of this stuff. And in a rural area, it means, well, you kind of stand about here and wave your hand when the bus comes and that's about right for the bus stop. And it's just kind of allowing us to think in the right ways about it. Because if I think a bus stop is always always has to have a pole and a and a sign on it, and you as you as you've described as people have described here, that doesn't happen in a lot of places. Then that means that we need to think about what a bus stop actually is, right? And okay. the sort of information that we need to capture. Do, is, has that made sense for it, you? Yeah. And these are really good questions. It really does, good yeah. questions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so from a Manchester perspective, we have all the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, we also everything. have uh, light rail. It's part of the National Napton data set, the 940 data set as well. So we do yes. actually, we manage that on behalf of DFT. So that's the 940 on behalf of uh, so uh, Greater Manchester. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Fortunately, I would this has been other recorded. Are the same as well, like yeah. Nottingham and yeah. Sheffield. Yeah behalf of DFT. Excellent, because that's a really good separate piece to know. Um, thank, so thank you very much, John. Di, you've got your hand up. Hi, um, literally just to take it back to basics, a bus stop is where the bus stops, regardless of what's there. Um, you know, at the, we've got from nothing, from your patch of earth where the bus traditionally stops to your full bells and whistles bus station mm -hmm. to a plate and a lamp column which may or may not get removed when they refresh the lamp columns um you know it's don't make it too complicated like it. it's literally just where the bus stops I like it. I like your definition. I think that's one of the most beautiful definitions that I've that I've heard. Um, are we okay to move on? Does does anyone have anything else to say on bus stops? And I know that I put some stuff on the disagree side. I just kind of wanted to separate those ideas out because this is going to help us think about what we need to do in terms of making your lives easier and better. And in, in the meantime, Ben will hopefully have been making my life better and we'll, we'll have some sort of link that I can put up and read out that's very, very short and to the point and is not a massively long link. Uh, yeah, so I've sent it to you on the chat, but otherwise it's uh, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash D-F-T top bus. Oh, oh, perfect. Ben is, ben is brilliant. I'm just actually going to stop doing that and on to the next one we're just going to put it in and I'll just throw it in there so that we can see it and I'll take out we want your fast feedback and you're all going to get to use this in a moment let me go back and start talking about accessibility ah oh, it takes me back to the start because of course PowerPoint why why do something sensible um so we've done what is a bus stop I wanted to talk about accessibility. So full full disclosure, I'm a stick I'm a stick user. I use a, I use City Mapper a lot to help me figure out the accessible and ways that I can get around London. So I, I've got a added interest in accessibility. Um, so what I wanted to look at is we know that we can get some accessibility data. We know that for the 2012 Olympics, a lot of effort went into making sure that that accessibility data and um, the schema was able to collect it. Now, we haven't done a good, um, I, this may sound like I'm beating up DFT, we haven't done a, the best job of making sure that we got that data from you. Um, and we want to improve on that. So what I want to ask you really super quickly is, if you could, would you tell us accessibility data? How would you do that? And when I say, how would you do that, is that we've already got this data and we'd just give it to you, or we'd need to go and do some surveys, or we'd collect it from our users. So thinking about the how you would do it, and what would change for you if you could do accessibility data? So now we've got this bit.ly DFT top bus, 
if you go to that link, you should be able to see the Murali that I was playing with. And it will ask you for a password. And the password is Naptan Uploaders with all the cases the way that I've done them. So if we swing across and have a look at the next screen, we should be able to move to accessibility. I love this. And you should all be able to see there is um, an, an area around, there are three different areas. If I could, I would. What, what would change for me and how would you? Now, over on the left-hand side here, there is a little thing that looks like a text and you can choose a sticky note. Um, choose your color of sticky note um, and just put your sticky notes on of what would change. If you could, you would. How would you? And what would change for you if you did? And you can use the zoom to make it fit on the screen and read a bit better. Now I'm going to use the timer and I'm going to set the timer for five minutes. Start timer. So when that timer goes, I will get an alert and I'll give you those few minutes and we'll read through them and have a quick discussion. Is everyone okay with this? Is everyone able to get into the bit.ly um, link and play around with this? Might need to share the password for a little bit longer. Oh, oh sorry. Let me just run back. The password is Naptan Uploaders, and you're getting a preview of what the next one is. Let me try to get this to behave in some way. Yeah, so it's Naptan hyphen uploaders, all kind of one word. And raise your hand if you've got any questions or queries. Swing across, let's have a look at this. So I can see a couple of people are starting to put stuff in. Um, is everyone getting to grips with how to use Murally? And putting those stickies on. So there's three kind of broad areas. If I could, I would. How would you and what would change for you? and put your hand up if you've got any technical issues or problems. Roger, how can I help you? Hi, I can't actually log in. Uh, okay, I is it? The login page showing in front of me, but uh, could could you just show me that password again? Make sure I'm actually in Certainly. Right it's uh, capital N, A, right, capital okay. P, G, A, N. Yeah, I, I, I got all capitalizing hyphen uploaders with a capital U. Did they get you in, Roger? No, I'm just doing the capture. Okay, we're in, thanks. Fantastic, no problems at all. So according to the tick box, there's about two minutes left. Um, if you try and use the sticky notes rather than text boxes, that's brilliant. Um, we'll just, believe it or not, this is one of the easier sharing um, uh, uh, type whiteboarding things that we've found. Jay, yeah, just want to make it clear where you go to get the sticky notes. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's on the left hand side. Um, and it's the second icon down and it, it, when you mouse over it, it says the word text. And when you open it up, there's some text boxes and then there's a pile of sticky notes of different colors. There's three by threes, five by threes and some circles. You can choose whatever color suits you and you feel co most comfortable with. Yeah. 
And Roger, I can see your hand is still up. Do you need? Oh, sorry, that was uh, that's a legacy hand. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Sounds like a medical condition. I've got legacy hand. <laughs> All these, all these online, online only conditions that we have uncovered. So when this finishes in just under a minute, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the sticky notes and group them a little bit, and then we can have a very quick discussion about if there's anything that other people have written or said that has triggered something for you, and we'll just do the usual hands up to speak. I'm loving all the different animals that appear. Visiting raccoons and everything. Oh, I like that sound. Did everyone else hear the sound or was it only me? I got a very proper kind of like a air, an airplane announcement ding dong sound uh, to tell me that time is up. I can see people are still working, so let's take another minute. Adrian's going to stress out about time, but it's completely OK, Adrian. This is all going to be fine. You're making assumptions. Uh, I'm seeing your face. Behind. <laughs> I'm, not stressed I'm out seeing about. your face. <laughs> so what I'm going to start doing in a moment is go through and r read out what's up there. And then anyone who has, um, feel free to just continue putting stickies up. So. We've got transport for Greater Manchester, I'm assuming, would need a review of all access points. This would be a significant undertaking. Uh, Kent County Council, I'm taking guess. Yes, we'd love to. A common standard would help a lot, though. Um, LA or regional data to ensure data similarities. Does this mean that um, I'm just trying to understand this one from the lovely person writing in blue? Does this mean that the data about accessibility needs to kind of meet a standard and be the same. Um, every stop would need surveying, which is a massive impact on resources. This would also need to be kept up to date. Just put that there because that's a group. Have an up-to-date order of all stops. Oop. Need to be clear what data is needed. If the bus stop if the bus stop actually is physical or not. Yes, that's very cool. Does the stop have a shelter or not? If the bus stop has a dropped curb. Oh, good, good. just a sec, I need to zoom in to read this one. Responsibility for surveying sites, LA infrastructure, information teams, operations, communications, mechanisms for maintaining. Agree to have the, agree the need to have accessibility available, but could the person who put that one in, would you mind putting your hand up and just explaining to me the but? Just so that I, I get it. I think I, I think I've got it from the other comments. I just want to make sure. Is that you, Di? That was me, but it was referring to having, surveying all the information and, and the undertaking related to that. Gotcha. Um, have limited information about curb raise drop curbs um, danger would be users relying on data where it's incomplete that's a really good point to ensure all areas had data there would need to be significant investment would need to survey stops which is resource limited uh, and okay and then we'll move across to the other side what would change for you so I'll just quickly run through what would change and then we'll go down to how would you and feel free to put your hands up to make any comments. Transport for Greater Manchester, an improved data set that would have real value to all public transport users. Kent County Council, some rural stops simply cannot be made accessible without, e.g. demolishing a listed building to make way. Yep. Southwest, some areas have the data already in our system depending on what is required. Could the person from Southwest just give me a quick 
chat about what data you've already got because that would help a little bit. Yep. Hi, we've Andy. got, yeah, hi. Um, we've got lots of different information depending what areas you're looking at. Gloucester and Hampshire, for example, have full stop assets in our DIVA system. So we've got curb heights, um, we've got shelter availabilities, we've got all the DDA compliant literature and things like that. Another big problem, which I was just about to write and post it was, it, it the stop can be accessible, but if the bus can't park there because there's an illegally parked car in the bay, it's not accessible. Mm -hmm. So accessibility can change minute by minute. Very true. Right, I'll just put a little uh, tag. Actually, I'll put this over here. If you could, you would. I'll just put a note. Uh, accessibility can change minute by minute by minute. Um, I also understand there's a, st so just to make sure, there's a standard of accessibility that you feel held to and are working towards. Would that be fair to ask? Is, is there a book of, like, I've I found um, TFL's one, so I'm, I know TFL has a whole thing about how bus stops are accessible and curb heights and things like that. Does everyone have that or is that only for the big places like Transport for London and Transport for Greater Manchester? Roger. That's certainly not something that we uh, we currently have. Uh, we have tools for gathering that information now, but um, those are pretty new. So uh, we're still about halfway through um, <clears throat> our stop fleet, as we think of it. Um, I, th I think the bigger problem actually is um, deciding on a common format here because you can't simply say that stop is accessible or that stop is not accessible. It can be accessible to certain vehicles, but not others, for instance. Um, so you, you, it, it's an interaction with the bus service at that point. Mm. So you need to decide um, exactly what level of detail you're aiming at um, because you can't just say it's accessible or it's not. Absolutely, and I agree that accessibility is uh, something that also changes. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to do two things at once. My brain won't allow it. Um, accessibility changes. I, I, I run accessible events and things can happen to make them less accessible. John, very quickly running to you and then we're going to move on while this, oh, Tansy, John, then Tansy, and then we'll move along. Yeah, Jay, John. we don't have have anything on uh, the guides as on what become what when a stop becomes accessible. We don't have any guidelines or anything like that. Cool. Thank you for thank you for letting us know. So no guidelines on when a stop is accessible. This leads to a whole pile of questions about what is an accessible stop, but we'll not do that right now. And Tansy, you had a thought. Um, yeah, so we don't currently have any guidance in Wales either. We have um, had discussions about it with Transport for Wales, um, but I, I kind of agree with the previous comments that there has to be certain levels and degrees of accessibility because um, the vast majority of stops in Wales are rural and in these areas where you don't even have a shelter or lighting, that level of accessibility is different from in urban areas where the curb height has to be correct and the bus needs to be able to pull up to the curb, etc. So, yeah, we, we are looking at different degrees of accessibility in Wales, I think. I think that's really important to understand as well when we try and collect this data, what what accessible means. Um, so let's sprint back. We're going to move on from accessibility and we're going to look at uploading files. Now, hopefully this will be really fast and we'll do this faster than anticipated and we'll catch up on some time. So really, really quickly. I know that you'll currently upload files. I know that we sent you a survey. This is me just seeking the tiniest little bit more information. So I'm going to ask you very quickly to go on to this 
stay on that mural. I'll take you down to the next bit. And it's about how you currently upload your files and what you think of the three different ways of doing it. There's one way, which is via some kind of FTP application. And I've got a picture of one, a standard one. I think it's FileZilla that I use. Whether you do it another way, another third party application, or you hand it off to somebody and they do it for you, or you do it via the NAPTAN website. And I just want to know whether or not you do it this way, and if you like it, or you think it's the worst thing ever. So let's just run back to the Murally. And if I click on this, it should take us down to the uploading files area that you can now see. Oh, wow, people are already starting on this. I'm, I'm, I'm loving you all for doing that. Um, if you just put in, so FTP applications on the left hand side, done another way down below and the website on the right hand side, just let us know your quick thoughts on those different ways of uploading. And I'll give you two minutes because we don't need quite so much time on this one, I don't think. Um, and then we'll just have a quick, super quick discussion and then we'll move on to the next one. Just to confirm, Jay, when we say website, we mean the DFT NAPTAN. NAPTAN we mean the DFT. DFT .gov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That gorgeous, beautiful thing that is the, the that beautiful, glorious thing called the NAPTAN app website is what we is what we're talking about um, with its. Yes. Okay, so you've got about 30 seconds left, and I'll do the same thing as I did last time of just reading through everything, grouping them together a little bit, and we can get people's hands up for comments and things like that. Oh, just bear with me here, two seconds because I have a delivery at my door, which always happens. Really helps that the timer sounded like a doorbell as well. <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a really useful exercise to us on top of the information that we'll get from the survey, just to understand where to focus our time, because um, already there's some interesting comments about using the website. Um, and how straightforward that is for those people who are using the FT who are using FTP. I'd be interested to know what application you're using. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your quick patience there. So let's go through. I'm going to start off with the applications like this one here. Um, website FTP was difficult to set up with with IT. FTP, I need to zoom in, I can't read that. FTP via batch files, I upload 22 areas at a time. Works great, although error checking is better on the website. Transport for greater, I'm assuming that's in Manchester, 940 changes sent via Excel to DFT, a clunky method. So, uh, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the person's name from Transport for Greater Manchester, my apologies, I'm bad with names. Does that mean that even though you're looking after those stops, you've got to tell DFT about them, you can't update them yourself, and yeah, you would like to be able to update them? That's correct, yeah. We, we have to send it via a spreadsheet highlighting what the changes are. And if we were to ask you to just upload them yourself using the 
um, application, would that be acceptable? Yeah. Anything that just cuts it down is, is a really clunky method. We have to send a spreadsheet and then we have to wait a number of weeks before it's actually live in the data set. Yeah, it's one of the things that we've highlighted that we don't have a sensible way of being able to update what we call the century managed stops or, or the things that come in via us. And it's one of the priorities to fix, to be honest, because um, the method of actually updating it isn't great. Cool. Brilliant. Um, so transport for Greater Manchester, 180 changes. This works fine. Uh, case uh, Kent County Council website because it doesn't upset our, our, our IT department. Easy to do. Upload onto DFT Napton website would be better to be able to update direct like the Gazetteer. Could somebody give me just a really quick run past that one? What do you mean by the Gazetteer? The MPTG. Yeah, I think it's me from, from Cambria. Um, no, it just we we keep our um, database on an Excel on a, a access database. So if, if I make a change to a bus stop the day after I've uploaded it to the DFT site, that will stay out of date for the next next month until I do the next update. Whereas with the Gazetteer, I can go on, I can change something, and it's it's in the system that that next day. So um, can you just help me understand what the Gazetteer is? It's the localities, places across um, across across the county. So, uh, so the villages or suburbs or just 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 groups of of bus stops, basically. So the MPTG stuff, just yeah. helping me understand, that's working really well. But the NAPTAN stuff takes a long time to update for you. Is that is that what I'm it, understanding? It works fine for us, but the, if if someone else is using, I mean, I, what, if if a bus operator puts a, a new service on which needs a, a, a bus stop, that's not in the data until I put it on onto the national system. Gotcha. I gotcha. Whereas if I could go um, straight onto the website and put a new bus stop, and, and also if you're changing the, the fields you want, you, you want an extra accessibility field, everyone, would have to, everyone across the country would have to change their software, which is all different. Whereas if it was on the one national website, you could put that extra field in it and we could all just upload to that as we came along. Yeah, yeah, I totally gotcha. And Mark, I think you're somebody that we're probably going to talk to a lot about this. Um, I'm seeing our future um, there. Let's run through CTV website, very easy to use, though I do not receive the email notifications. Those are the ones that say everything went coolly or everything went eh. I'm assuming that that's what those are. And please put your hand up and talk to me if, if it's not. Um, SCC use DFT website to upload new files straightforward to use. Process to upload is relatively simple. Transferring the data is not the issue. The problem is getting information back on the errors. ITO is very confusing. We'll come to data correction and data pieces later, but that's really good to know. DFT website is clunky. Now it has been changed. It's difficult to navigate. Bring back the previous one. Um, I think you might be the only person who liked the previous one, but uh, I really want to understand what you find clunky with the current site, whoever wrote that, if you don't mind letting us know, or you can email us later. Okay, um, the download section could do with being better laid out are you save buttons at the top and bottom of the page, top of page and not just the bottom so we're running the same kind of session with people who are downloaders so if you've got comments about downloading we'd really invite you to come to that session as well because we're trying to understand as people who upload data are there some of you who also download data are there some of you who also consume the data that comes out of NAPTAN or are the people who put data in and people who consume it completely separate groups? And that's an interesting question to ask. Roger, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes, we do both. Um, we have certain systems which are nothing to do with um, actually maintaining our um, scheduling information, uh, which nevertheless use NAPTAN. Um, and it's not always our NAP. Uh, OK, so so. Um, I think you're another person that we may be having a longer chat with at some point, just to kind of dig down into that dual usage in those different systems. Di. Yeah, I 
um, have to have my surrounding authorities. I download their NATAN data because I'm doing cross boundary services. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be that side as well as mine. Right. So that's really good to know. Um, and like Beth. Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. Yeah, we also do cross boundary stuff, but I think last count we downloaded, I think 10 different um, Napton data sets from the DFT website um, to be able to put into our central system. We also look after real time for most of Yorkshire um, as part of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. The operators provide the data to us and then we will upload it, but also we need that information from the bus stops um, to be up to date as best as possible. It was myself that put the save option um, would be nice at the top rather than at the bottom because I do download and upload on a regular basis, especially because recently we're having major issues with our um, upload um, section. So, but yeah, we do a lot of stuff for West Yorkshire for most of Yorkshire. So, so when you say you do real time, does that mean that you pro provide the real time information for the whole of West Yorkshire across all of those boundaries? Just trying to get my head into it. The operators provide us with data. Smaller ops um, comes out of our system. So your little rural ones come out of our systems. Mm -hmm. uh, major operators such as First Bus, Arriva, et cetera, provide their own. We then process that and then upload that to a, a is it fix. I know Lisa Geraldine knows a bit more about this than I do. Um, sounds like she's on the line. Uh, yeah, I am. Yeah, <laughs> banging still going on. <laughs> yeah, so Lisa can provide you. But we have, we download the Naptan bus stops from the DFT website, and um, these are the DSB file format, which we then work with to be able to process the real time from most of, if not all of Yorkshire. Yeah, exactly. And a bit of Yorkshire. Yeah, uh, and um, East Midlands. East we do Midlands. bits for. Yeah, East Yorkshire. Hull. Cool. Yeah, We've got about twenty two areas we download from. Do you want to know one of the things that I'm going to do next time I do this? I'm going to get a map of the UK. So I have an understanding of where you're all from. Um, so I've done that. DFT validator could be easier to find from the main app site. Um, I have some theories that we'd, I'd like to play with, and I think that'll be part of the next stages of Dow Diving, deep, diving deeper into how we can make your life better, which is the next thing we're going to go on to. We take a weekly download for our National Journey Planner. DFT website is clunky. Website uploader is easy to use, although I no longer receive email notifications to confirm it's been successful. Thank you, Ben or Andy, for putting in a, a map of where places are. This works fine, provided the data is formatted correctly. Thank you. And doing it another way, we've got the clunky emails. Is there anything else that anyone thinks about the uploading process or anything like that that anyone wants to tell us? It feels like a lot of you use the website apart from the apart from um, the people who are doing the batch files. Excellent. Right, let me move along because we're going to now go into a longer feedback session. Um, I, I think we're going to have about a good 50 minutes for this. So I, I think this is where we can really focus on getting a lot of your feedback and your ideas. It's around data validation and data correction. We know that Naptan data needs to be solid gold because it runs so much stuff. It is the thing. Well, NPTG is also the thing, but the two of them combined are the thing that runs most of the transport infrastructure software across the country. And having solid gold, beautiful data in there it is a really good goal. And to get that, we need to help you with your data validation and data checking and letting you know when things don't quite match, letting you know when there's problems. What I want to understand is what data do you need to validate? How uh, how are you validating? And uh, asking why why you check it might sound illogical given the statement that I've just made, but I need to understand why you check it and not assume that what you do is right um, and, and how you check it. I'm trying to understand what we can do in software that will 
take away and give you the brain to do the bigger checks, if that makes sense. If we can do the simple stuff in software and tell you <clears throat> that you've got a duplicate or something like that, that saves you a lot of time. <clears throat> so I want your feedback. So I'm going to, you're going to see me work now. Um, I'm going to go down to the next spot and I would like you to put your hands up and just start talking and I'm going to just put notes everywhere. Feel free to add notes to here as well about data validation and data checking. So does anyone have any thoughts? Everyone loves loves the data validation we currently have. Roger, please start us off. Sorry, it's a question more than anything. What do you mean by um, what do we check? What do we validate? I mean, surely I mean, we're talking about NAPTAN here. Presumably there's no part of it you wouldn't check. Is there Have parts I misunderstood the question? Um, it's kind of trying to understand. I've made the assumption that you check everything. People may say, I don't check. Um, my, my villages were set up 500 years ago before the country that I was born in was actually created. And I never need to check. I never need to check the village names or anything like that. So it's trying to understand how you think of checking. Does that make sense, Roger? Yes, thank you. That clarifies. So um, feel free to call out and give me thoughts or put them in there. We I want to focus. I've given us about 50 minutes. We've got till 10 to 12 to go through and cover this. Beth, your thoughts, please. Yeah, just as mentioned, the uh, DFT website validator could be a lot easier to find. It took me about 15 minutes of Googling. Um, as previously mentioned, we've got a lot of issues with our NAPTAN at the minute. Um, and one of these things was I needed to validate it. Couldn't find it on the website. Now you've changed websites. It was on the previous one, but now I had to Google it. So that could be a lot easier. And what does the validator give you that you find better than any other tool? Just it essentially kind tells of... that the data we're providing it is, I believe, um, is is correct to be uploaded. Um, we're, we're trying a number of different things to try and make sure our new bus stops are installed, uh, sorry, uploaded correctly to the bus stop, uh, to the DFT website. So I, I would like to think it would tell me that, yeah, the, the information, the XML file I'm uploading is correct. Mm-hmm. And that's literally it, but it, it was just, it would be easy to find, would be a lot better for me. Yeah. Them. Cool. And just to be certain, something that passes the validator, to your knowledge, has always passed being uploaded without yeah. any errors. So if it gets through the validator, you know that it's going to get through the upload. Yes. That, that's the theory. Yes. Yes. I wanted, I know that's the theory. I wanted to double check if it actually works. <laughs> Um, I'm not 100% certain at this point, but yeah, that's the theory is if it says it's validated and it's fine, then yeah, you should be able to upload it. Okay. Excellent. Um, I want to ask a, a very quick question of people. When you upload your files, do you upload all of your region or do you just upload the changes? What What is the way that people work most? Do you upload your 2000 bus stops or do you just upload the two that have changed? John, you've got an answer. We do the whole region. And if we're doing multiple changes, we'll do multiple loads as well. So sometimes we load in twice a day. Right. Um, for multiple changes, cool. Um, is that because of how you create the XML file or is that because of your current internal uh, processes. Yeah, so we, yeah. we, 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 we might get told a bus stop has been moved in the morning and we'll upload a new data set to say that show this bus stop's been moved and then in the afternoon we might get another uh, notification to say certain bus stops have been uh, added on or moved, uh, moved to another location. Gotcha. Um, Andy, do you have some comment? Your, your hand is up. Yeah, we up, I upload weekly the whole of the area, but if any of my local authorities say, right, we've done some major changes on our stops, I'll upload as and when as well. So, you know, we can do it as a drop of a hat. Um, 
the weekly one where it's all 22 local authorities, it's done by the batch file. That doesn't get validated so well. If you know, if it doesn't import, I know that it, there could be a problem. Although we do a lot of validation and and audits and error checking of the stock data that we hold in our master database, uh, the export to Naptan uh, just fails if it's uh, if there's an error and there's no. We don't seem to get a, a prompt until you upload it through the website when we'll get a good validation and why what caused it to fail and then I can go look uh, see what's missing mm -hmm. uh, but on the checking side any extra checking of the data quality is is brilliant you know we've we've got 60 odd thousand stops in our area uh, some of which haven't been touched for 10 or so years um, because it's just a, a gate in a in near a field or the, at the end of a field on a little road in Cornwall so uh, <laughs> yeah 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 um thank you for that and I think you and I are definitely going to have a lot more conversations Mark Mark Taylor sorry I, I realize there's probably more than one Mark OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading through some of the stickers that are there. So my software relies, my software validates the data to a certain extent. Unique SMS code, ACTO code, correct number of stops within a stop error, etc. The NAPTAN guidelines have much more strict criteria regarding stop names, some of which there is actually no alternative solution or making the obvious change will cause a different error message. So this is the, the NAPTAN schema is doing dumb things or we're doing dumb things with our software. I just kind of wanted to understand this. No, it's the schema. It's the schema. Yeah. Let me could just I, put a little. Could I yeah. ju jump in? I had my microphone turned off. It's Mark Taylor here. Oh, oh thanks, Mark. I apologize about that. Um, my stomach sort of turned it off. <laughs> Squashed <laughs> against the table. <laughs> Um, all I was going to say is that we make sure that when we send off our data, it's it's um, it pucker it meets the tests. But um, a lot of authorities have been under a lot of um, criticism for errors in their data. Um, I think Passenger um, were whispering in DFT's ear about this, and um, we've you know they've they've produced they've produced data for us to check, um, which is the right way of going around things to having some independent check to make sure that um, it is up to date and we haven't made silly mistakes in terms of the road name or the direction of the road where the bus stop is. Um, unfortunately, the ITO World NAPTAN management tool is being withdrawn at the end of this uh, calendar year. Now that was a major tool for helping people um, find errors which they weren't aware of because we don't spend all of our time just looking for errors there's plenty of other work for us to be getting on with um, so I think we need to get together as local authorities as and users and and come up with an alternative to this ITO world test and the tests which DFT have presented us and and come up with a good set of tests which we can refer to um, and amend our data accordingly and this is the sort of forum that, and the place to get this kind of work started. I think that's brilliant. And I really, really appreciate your positivity around around this and your and your positive steps forward. So I've I'm putting the Eto World stuff as grey, not because I think it's grey, but because it's the easiest colour that I don't think anyone else has used so that we can I can easily find things later. Um so Give me a second to finish reading through the rest and then we'll focus on talking about Eto World, what it did for you and what you need to replace it. Does that sound a great thing for everybody? Just to, we'll do, I'll quickly run through what else is there. I'll group up Eto World. I'll make a little corner for Eto World and we can really discuss that and dig into it. So just give me two minutes to run through the rest and then we'll dive on into Eto World. So we've got the schema issue with the ACTO code and the and the sensible changes don't validate. We have a single database that contains all our public transport information data, so checking is essential. 
Any checking is great so we can improve quality. DFT validator is hidden. Yes, yes, it's very hard to find. Checking that to make sure that stops are in the correct place. Checks are based on current NAPTAN uh, management guidelines in ETO World. I'll put that up with the ETO World. Um, use ETO World tool for validation. Kent County Council, I'm hoping is the K. We upload regions as they change and upload the whole region rather than file doubters as this just 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 as this is reliable. We rely primarily on ETO World for data checks, but do take feedback from operators and public routing names. We find that different parties disagree, so we have to arbitrate. Yes. Um I can't remember what the O is. OCC have not Oxford, been able to find sure. the valid. Oxfordshire, thank you, have not been able to find the validator since the website was updated. Allow us to, um, in what we send out, can we make a note that we will send out a link to the validator? Um, I've nicknamed it Vlad, um, Vlad the validator, um, so that we can be sure that people can find what they're looking for. Um, passenger checking tool, some errors reported are inaccurate, e.g direction indicators. So let me just double check this one. This is the passengers are able to tell you where things are wrong simply because the buses are heading in the wrong direction. Trisha, I'm thinking this comes from you. Yeah, it does. No, so there's a tool that passenger have, it's bus, a bus stop checker tool that ah. um, I can look at Nottinghamshire and it tells me I've got so many um, errors. Um, their direction indicator on, on some stops say that it should be west when I've got it as east, and it's clear, and it's definitely east. Their tool is wrong, um, but there's no way of then saying this is a, a false error. You know, so obviously it um, it makes it look like we've got more errors than we have. Mm -hmm. I'm just making a note that passenger is a third party system and not just the name of the people what are travelling. Um, for myself, so that so that I remember, um, upload entire. So thank you for that. That's really important, and I think we can give that feedback to passenger and have a look at how we can incorporate some of that crowdsourcing um, into and how we do those checks. Because I think that's really important. Mark, do you have a comment that here, or is your is this a legacy hand? Uh, oh shoot! It's a legacy hand. I apologise. <laughs> no problems I, at all. I would just say that we do you. We haven't used. We've we've been presented with passenger figures, and the mapping that they were using, the tool that they were the the checks they were doing were, um, in a lot of cases, wrong. Like uh, like the previous um, commentator said, um, and feedback to them didn't seem to go anywhere. I I think they. I don't I don't know. I don't know whether they're trying to get some, I don't know, some money out of this or what, but I suppose it's it, it, it's a problem with ITO as well in that the tests that they present us with are going to be based on a certain mapping and certain certain computational whatever they are, and and they're going to get it wrong sometime. But it, it's mm -hmm. it's it's having a sensible set of tests which we can then pass the judgment to say whether it's correct or not and feed back to them. I think that's really great feedback. Let me just add this up here. Um, so sensible tests with feedback. Feedback, because that's letting us know. So I see a comment that the passenger tool is poor, so not worth using. NCC ETO World tool is an essential tool in managing the data, please keep it available for authorities. I'm going to put that down there and we'll come to the ETO World discussion in a moment. Upload entire data set, usually monthly, though more frequently if there has been a change. There is a difference between, oh, just let me, the difference between the strict compliance within the NAPTAN schema and the guidance about stop name conventions that cannot be coded into the schema. Let me put that over here. And this becomes some of those business rules issues that we can have a look at and see if we can help out and make and help people make sense. This this one I have to zoom in slightly. I uploaded the whole uh might just make this the damn thing bigger. I upload the whole region and not just changes as our system NAPTAN outputs are a full XML. I use the ETA world just to double check for errors. It can be something simple as putting the 
incorrect direction indicator, but also highlights if you have bus a stop with the same name in the locality. I'm assuming there's a lot of high street bus stops um, and things like that within within the system. So let's have a discussion on the um, elephant within the room of Eto World. Let's discuss Eto World and how it fits into your workflow and what it gives you so that we can understand what we need to give you and also discuss other third party tools like passenger on the side. Does that sound a reasonable focus for the next 20 minutes or so? Um, I'm assuming quietness is, is agreement. So yes. Just... <laughs> I figured if you, if you disagreed, you'd tell me. So Eto World and checking. So I want to understand how, what Eto World gives you that we don't currently. Jared. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. I'll I, I put a hand up quite quickly on this. I think the sort of value of, of, I, I, I wasn't sort of thinking in terms of I've raw, but I think the benefit of ITO world versus something that started from scratch is that I don't know the history behind them, but I know that the, you know, some of the people who work there have sort of expertise directly in, you know, maintaining nap times or, or working in travel lines. So it's, it's developed from people who actually, as I understand it, been in the position that we're all in. And I think there's a sort of, it's not perfect by any means, but I think there's certainly sort of a level of insight that's quite helpful. Um, rather, and I'm not, you know, I'm not here to critique any sort of replacement tool because I don't really know enough about the replacement tool. But I think that an expertise and understanding of the realities of sort of data, of, of stock processing and maintaining stocks is, is really sort of helpful. It's probably quite a general point, but I just wanted to highlight that. Yep, that's 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 great to know. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts about Eto World? And I know that there's an open NAPTAN. I know that this is a big contentious issue. So I I really want to give you a forum to just go for it. I'm I have asbestos pants on. I have a very thick skin. You can be uh, you can say exactly what you think about this change. I am happy to listen to it all. Roger, you're up. Just to, just to say that I, I don't think that there is another tool like Eto out there at the moment. Um, I've certainly seen nothing that comes close. Uh, various people have complained about the passenger tool. We tried it. We found it generated nothing but false positives for us. Um, <clears throat> the basic checks that come with your, uh, your Naptan editing software are usually just that, very, very basic. Um, and some of these checks... I think can only be done post hoc, like the ones to do with um, distance to a road, that kind of thing. Um, I, I doubt that's something that can be quickly and easily done in software um, in a live environment. So we rely on it very heavily. Um, I, I don't really know of a replacement right now. If anybody else does, please tell me. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good to know. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts? I see things appearing and disappearing from my eye line. Uh, Derek. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly in the West Midlands region, we use sort of the ITO World tool a lot. And it's it's a pretty good, straightforward tool that you can go straight into. It lists any issues with your particular stops. Um, it's sort of designed very much for local authorities to use. And I must admit, I was rather disappointed by the fact that I only happened to notice that it was finishing when I saw a little sort of um, uh, little note at the top of the actual page saying that, uh, you know, this will this will finish. And I must admit, any of the alternative tools don't seem to be very sort of, I don't know, local authority friendly. And I think really the LAs have sort of not really been, um, I don't know, sort of uh, treated sort of properly really because I mean we are the people who deal with NAPTAN, keep NAPTAN up to date, send off the data whenever and respond quickly to any changes that go on because I mean we're getting obviously a lot of new stops appearing in our area with you know new developments and things and I send that off, I can check into ITO World 
and it will tell me if there's any issues, um, what they are, and and you know the mapping tool on there is quite useful. Also, I found for sort of um, when I'm sort of actually creating routes and things, especially for out county services, I can actually just find on their ITO map the stops themselves and click on them and find out the codes easy and I can actually do on my own trapeze system. So I find it's useful in quite a lot of ways in both keeping my stops accurate and also for plotting routes and things where there's limitations on the system I use. So um, I think it's quite disappointing that it's it's going and the fact that we got really <laughs> sort of notice about it. So I'm a bit <laughs> disappointed with that, to be honest. And the alternatives, as other people have said, don't really appear to be up to scratch at present. There's too many sort of false readings. And um, so that's my little rant over there anyway. <laughs> I you. really appreciate your rant and thank you. Um, hopefully, <laughs> I, let me know if I if, if I haven't captured things correctly when I'm grabbing things on, on screen. Um, Rob, thank you for joining us. Uh, would uh, You're up next to give us your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I missed the beginning of the meeting, so I didn't introduce myself properly. I'm, I think I'm probably known to to several uh, people here. Um, Illidium is a supplier, actually, so we're not a local authority or um, an uploader of the data, but we create tools um, that uh, work with NAPTAN data. Um, we are, at, and we're not the only ones, we are in a position to actually create potential replacements to ETO tools or to work with the uh, DFT Open NAPTAN software. Um, but as a supplier, it's very difficult to know what to build. I mean, it's sort of useful for me to sit on this call to hear what people are saying. Um, it sounds like some of the checks provided by ETO do need to be replaced. Um, I think Roger just mentioned distance to the roads and, and something like that. Um, all of this stuff can be done and it doesn't need to cost a lot of money and it doesn't need to take a lot of time. But before any kind of supplier is going to commit to building a new tool, we need to understand that there's a market there um, to be able to do that. Um, I'm happy to engage with anybody um, to try and you know, work as a supplier would, gather some business requirements and put together, you know, a proof of concept if if there's interest in, in people, you know, from people to do that. Thank you for that. I um, really appreciate it. Uh, Andy, you're up next. And Jared, is this a, le I'm, I'm wondering if that's a legacy hand. If not, you're after Andy. A legacy, so I'll get rid of it. Thanks. Could we just have a quick check on? The, I think there's a couple of legacy hands, or I, I can see a few. Um, if they can just check if, they, if, they, if they've still got a current hand up or, or not, that'd be helpful. Um, mine's keeping up to date, Adrian. Hopefully, yeah. oh, so I think Andy's right. Andy's the next the next person to okay. talk. Well, my thing about ITO, the, the ability to suppress the warnings, because not all their warnings, like passenger, are actually. Uh, are actually valid. Some of the distance to road is they haven't updated their their maps where we take a weekly upload of our maps. Um, the thing with the ITO warnings, they're a commercial company making a lot of money out of our open and free data. Um, surely they should be checking it as they're making a lot of money out of it anyway for the to, to ensure the quality to their downstream users. Couldn't they carry on using it um, or carry on checking it and just make the money from that? And the same for Rob, I'm assuming with your commercial company. Um, you know, the, the open data the local authorities create costs us money to check it. Well, you know, it, the commercial side should be checking it for free, I would, would suggest. I'm happy to comment on that. Um, Illidium's a, a small company, a startup. Um, if I'm going to be very honest with you, you know, I need to feed my children. You know, I can't go off and develop tools for nothing. Um, but what I can do is if there are 140 odd local authorities who all need the same checks, I can spend a few thousand pounds to develop something that's going to cost each local authority a few hundred pounds job done. Um, you know, that's how a small business works. That's that's the business that I represent. Um, I wouldn't like to comment on behalf of any other suppliers. They all have their own business models. Excellent. Do we have any other? Oh, Trisha. 
I was just going to say that the DFT um, have data quality checks as part of timetable and moot uploads and feed those back to um, operators um, and that's free. So why can't the DFT develop some sort of checker that when we upload our NAPTAN, it gives you um, a data quality report back that way? If you mm -hmm. do, if you're providing it for free for operators on their routes and, sh and timetable data, why would you not do that for local authorities and NAPTAN data? Yep, uh, uh, reporting slash checking tool. I think that's a really good point. Um, that must lead you to feel like you've not been cared for because we're doing it for bus operators, but not for local authorities. Don, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, just that it would seem like the proposal is to go from something that we're getting for free for the minute at local government level to potentially having to pay for something. So you will you will get that people Authorities won't pay for it because we don't have the budget even for a couple of hundred. Um, and we will do the minimum that we can get away with, which won't benefit the overall data set. Definitely. Absolutely. If we want if we want gold standard data, we've got a and that solid gold disco data, we want to have you we want to give you the tools to build that. We want to help you make that lovely shiny top quality, top shelf data for us, because without that, NAPTAN's, I wouldn't say pile of junk, but not as useful, not as good as it could be. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts here? We've got about another 10 minutes, and then I want to run on to a final little piece for you all. Um, so here's a quick question to throw out for you. Is my dream of solid gold quality data an achievable dream? Is this an unrealized utopia? I am heading towards some kind of socialist socialist um, thing, or is this actually something that that you think could be done? Jared, uh, sorry, my stutter gets in the way when I try to say Jared. Jared, no, uh, no, your thoughts? Um, um, I think it is achievable, but I think that we've got to be realistic. So, you know the the budget constraints are absolutely crucial. I will completely support the previous comment um, that you know, as I say, budgets are very tight, and the, it, the the bottom line is that you know third party apps are arguably potentially making a lot of money out of what is potentially public data, but that's another issue. Um, we can achieve this, but I think it's absolutely essential. There is a nationwide accessibility standard. There's a recognition that this is labour intensive to actually agree a standard to actually have the people to go out and actually physically check every single stop. There are other ways of doing this that potentially you could be innovative and cooperate with operators and actually say, well, if you've got a dash cam on a bus route or on a bus on a bus route, can you actually use that data and just play the sort of video of the bus route that actually would enable you to, once you have a standard, see whether stops are accessible or not and get round this sort of very big difficulty, which is a lot worse outside London because of geographical spread of areas, um, of physically checking every single stop, which may not be realistic. But if we think innovatively, there's a very important prize that, that is beneficial to not only, you know, wheelchair users for, it, for which accessibility is crucial, but, even, you know, people with push chairs, people are sort of uncertain. So. It's certainly a prize worth aiming for, but to get there, we've got to really appreciate the constraints, appreciate the budget constraints, the staffing constraints, but also try and think innovatively with the um, things that we've got, i.e. the bus operators and maybe sort of dash cams and things like that. I think that's a brilliant thing. Um, I have some thoughts on accessibility, but I think it's better to have an entire session dedicated to it then then kind of bring those in um but i think it's it, that's a really important extra set of data and i love the dash cam machine learning ai idea that i think would be really brilliant trisha your thoughts please um yeah well the gold solid standards i was kind of thinking back to your original picture that you draw drew with the blind person at a bus stop that had 
um, been temporarily moved because of roadworks. Um, and just as a local authority concerned how that is achievable, um, because it's not al always, um, we're not always told when bus stops are closed by people doing roadworks. Um, some authorities have permit schemes, some authorities don't, some um, works promoters will put out temporary stops, some won't. Um, and it's actively managing that. Um, if, they, if it's a temporary one, systems might need to be updated so that we um, we temporarily move it and it switches it back after a certain date. Um, it's just how we would work moving temporary stops that may only be moved a couple of days or a week um, and how we keep on top of that, really. Mm. That's good to know um, on top of things like that. Um, because that drives us into some of the future thinking ideas. Um, Ro Roger, you've got some thoughts, and then Hello, back to Jared. Um, yes, I, I think there's there's a compounding problem there, which is the um, the build cycles um, of, of various journey planners. If they're not doing a build every single day with fresh NAPTAN information, as Traveline at the moment does a weekly build. Um, then you have a situation where you cannot reflect um, short term changes at all. Um, there's just no way to do it. Um, so, so that has to be taken into account. I think we, we either have to think about how to improve journey planners so that they are capable of doing a, a weekly build, which I'm sure is no, no small task, or we, we just have to accept that certain changes can't be reflected. I think that's really good. Um, and I tried to reflect that in the little diagram, this little, uh, you get this via API. So I was trying to think about that, but that's really good to bring it out. And that's a great consideration. Um, Di, and then Andrew, and then Keith, and then back to Jared. So well, Di, you're next this, up. Um, even with advanced planning for roadworks, they often get cancelled due to weather. Um, obviously very short notice, or you get very short notice that they're actually coming in because it's an emergency. Uh, and the other thing is that we very frequently do not find out if the authorities have upgraded bus stops to be your low floor and, or put a sh change the shelter so it's now got a timetable frame or whatever. So we just don't find out this information. So it's about getting the information from the local authorities to yourself as a central kind of person for the Thames Valley. Is that right? Thames Valley. Um, Sorry. It, well, yes, but also, you know, for the, with the best will in the world, we're a team of three and we have jobs and we can't be sat waiting for stuff mm -hmm. to come in to cancel what we've already spent weeks putting together just because the weather's changed. We put it on mm -hmm. our Facebook page, we put it on our website, but to actually upload a system and to hope that you might hit the one person that potentially is affected is, you know, it's quite a big ask. Oh, a oh, absolutely. Time for that. I'm, I'm all about unrealized uh, uh, utopian visions that drive us forward. Um, so let's go to Andrew and and then Keith. So Andrew, um, you're up yeah. next. So, but yeah, um, I guess it's all about resources. And I guess in West Yorkshire, we um, we have in our combined authorities, we have a highways team who are, who engage with local authorities and find out when bus stops are moved and diversions are available. And we've been given a tool by Transport for the North so that we are able to try and put this data into the tool it's kind of open data and this and now um, journey planners are able to use that data that we put in the tool to say there's a diversion here there's a road closure there bus stops are moving here and there yeah so that is that is what we're trying to do but I guess you need resources to, to do that and I guess luckily we've we've got um, people in our contact center uh, we, we we have a department um, able to do that yeah but and also I liked what Gerard said about the bus operators helping out, helping us out because they're going to benefit in the long run because the data will be better. Um, so that's a good innovation. Um, dash cams, it's a good, it's a good idea. So um, if 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 bus operators are going to benefit, they yeah, let, let's suggest that they do that. 
work together for all benefit. Excellent. I love the socialism. Um, so uh, that was Andrew Keith. Love to hear from you. Keith, can we, Greg, can we get you off mute? Sorry. <laughs> uh, right. That's Greg, okay. What you were saying about um, buses being taken, uh, bus stops being taken out of service. We have an ICS system and we've had it for years that we can influence the journey planners so that even if the journey plan is only built once a, once a week, we can still influence those journeys and pass that through mobile apps, etc., down to the user. But this also takes me back to something we said very early on about the MPTG editor is live online and gets straight into the system, whereas Naptan, we've got to work on it in our own systems and then upload it and then it gets out, out there. So it's, there's that rotation the date, the, the, of the data flow that's missing. If we had a web editor, that we could all log into, we'd uh, eliminate some of the time that's taken processing. Mm -hmm. That's okay. really great. That's that's really great. I just wanted to ask, because uh, I don't do your job, what does ICS mean? Could you just give me like a two second it's, understanding? Uh, basically, if the, it's an incident, incident system. So if you've got a problem, I don't know. Uh, Can some, somebody type here with me, I've got someone at the door. Okay. Andy, Andy Hull, um, what does ICS mean, please? Incident capture system. That's the one. I couldn't think of it. <laughs> I just call it ICS. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry about that. Incident. That it's the joy of living alone and, and just having uh, a very sharp knock on the door and like, what is going on? Uh, incident system. Right, it's a capture system. Basically, if there was a problem along a route at a particular stop, say, say for instance, it was an accident, we can actually put that into the incident system, and that will go through and influence how a journey is planned, and that can be fed down through web, through web, an app, etc. Now, if it's planned incidents, it's even better, even easier. That sounds brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Keith. Um, mm. The next person down is Mark. And then Roger and then Chris. Um, hi. Um, ICS is very good. Um, you've got to think when you're doing temporary um, temporary works to stops and that temporary closures, um, that needs to be coded up into a timetable. And and it's often, I mean, one thing persuading a, a bus company to recode their schedules for a short term change. Um, it's often better to, to um, treat it as an exception and use something like the ICS to um, to affect journey plans so it re reflects reality. It, does that make sense? Yeah, that sounds really good. I didn't even know such a thing existed. I am well, learning got, so got to, much from all of this. We normally, the way we do it, if, it, if the change is under four weeks, uh, we don't recode our data. Um, we'll leave the existing files in, but use the ICS to manipulate the data so that the passenger gets sensible journey plans. And I think if you're giving giving over um, responsibility for creating data more to operators, they're not going to be rescheduling data for sm sh short term changes if it doesn't materially affect their business. They're not going to bother. Um, the other thing I'd say is that I'm dubious about using um, direct editing of Naptan through a website, because certainly for us, we're also um, recording data on assets relating to a bus stop, and it doesn't make any sense to me to be editing data in two different places. So we'd, I'd prefer so, at the moment to edit my Naptan and the associated assets with it in one place and upload it to you. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to do it in two. I wouldn't want to do it in two places. That's daft. I totally, I totally appreciate your viewpoint. I just need to understand when you say assets, are you talking about like the seat and the glass and yeah, the timetable thing and the pole? Yeah, and the pole, and it's got a raised platform and all that sort right. of malarkey. Yeah, yeah. All the physical things. Yeah. Excellent. 
physical things. Can I just dive um, into that a second, Jay? Sorry, to, I, I'm really interested in that view about updating a single stop or a small bit through web editor. I'd be interested in the views of somebody who said that they'd like to do that and how they feel about updating, potentially updating the data twice. Is that something they'd consider? Is that something that feels like it would be easy to do and therefore worthwhile? Um, just be interested to get some views on that. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left. So can we, uh, I just want to wrap up the people who've got their names up and then we'll go down to our last thing, which is one more thing. Now, what I'll do is we might not get to the one more thing. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just, if we don't get there to, to do a single sticky, because you all know how to do a sticky now, just do a single sticky with one thing that would improve your life that we could do. But let's hear from Chris and then Andy. Uh, hello, right. My um, uh, feeling is about the sort of the, the use of ICS. It's a fantastic system in the sense that it can put information up onto the travel line network. Um, but my, I have two hats. I, I, I operate within the sort of the public transport system, but I also operate within the network management system for, for Oxfordshire. And um, we, we are looking towards uh, sort of connectivity within the two. We, we use routinely the one network system. This is known as the Elgin system as well. And it's a frustration that we don't have a connectivity between uh, say the one network system and uh, the ICS system. Can we put a notice up on ICS to say that bus stops are diverted or closed and does it feed through? No, it doesn't. So it's it's connectivity. And uh, in in the management of uh, sort of situations in real time, um, the Siri SX system, which is uh, I, I don't think this is implemented between the the current uh, ICS system and any other any other outlets. But uh, let's talk about this. So, um, so ICS and other outlets. Um, I f am feeling that there's an entire discussion that we could have around ICS and 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 how that works. So let's quickly run through Andy, Graham, then John, getting your feedback, and then we'll go and have a look at this one one thing. So Andy first. Hi, I was just wanted to mention or say it's it's a bit of a shame that we keep reinventing the wheel. Um, we mm. were or Travel line South West, Travel line South East, East Anglia, East Midlands, West Midlands were all in a single system, a single DEBA system supplied by MENTS. And we have the ICS system. We've got fares available. We've got uh, real time available on our systems. We've got stop asset management and things like that. Now the BODS comes in and all of those things are thrown away. Rather than building on this, the tools that we have and the way we're running, we already had open data with the TNDS, which worked very well for, and has worked very well for many years. You know, if we had built on that system rather than reinventing the wheel again and starting from scratch, it could have saved the local authorities a lot of money and we'd have a far better system. Uh, uh, would have a better system. Thank you for that. I really appreciate your, your thoughts there. Um, and we will definitely talk more. Um, then I've got, that was right, Graham. Yeah, no, it was just very quickly to say, I mean, we're in a similar position eh, to West Midlands and maybe other authorities where we do actively manage the stops within our own systems. So we wouldn't want to be, or certainly our users wouldn't want to be entering them on a web and then you know, double entering mm -hmm. them somewhere else. But we were wondering, um, as part of any developments, whether any APIs would be developed so we could just almost, you know, put it in our system and it just talks to whatever you're developing in the future so it can update it there and then or update it overnight. And so we don't even have to do a, a, night, a weekly or twice weekly process of uploading. It just, you know, we can just set it and off it goes. That would be, that would be great. And um, that is something that I think we need to look into. Uh, uh, John, and then we'll go and we'll take the last couple of minutes just to do the wrap up and look at this one thing. 
Yeah, sorry, it's only really quick. Uh, and I think it's already been mentioned. Uh, at Manchester, we use the DF, uh, Transport for the North disruption tool for shutting stops down temporary, uh, and that produces a Surrey SX feed that we've currently got a number of journey planners using now. Uh, Move it and City Mapper are two examples that are using that data. Excellent. That's great to know. And that also gives us people to talk to and we'll, we'll definitely come and talk to you. So taking a deep breath from that, we've done all of this discussion. Um, I want us to focus on one last thing and I'm not even going to go to the site. I just want you to take a sticky, write one thing on it. I can see a paragraph. I'm not going to limit your words because you need to explain it, but I'd like you to write out one thing that we could fix for you that would make your life better. Now, I know asking you for one thing is huge because you've got so many different things. I want you to think about the one thing that we could do. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you um, a minute to write your one thing, and then we're going to quickly group them and look at the biggest grouping of the one things. So we know the one thing that we should be really focusing on, what should be our priority set by you. Just while you do that, thanks, Jay. Um, I'm going to post a link to the survey sent out. It closes on Friday. Most of you might have, um, so really appreciate you linking the chat to uh, to the survey. If you've not filled it out, you've got until Friday to do it. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Um, Corey, if you send me the link, I will also add it to the uh, tech session uh, PowerPoint so that when people get this, they can fill it out. And we'll also keep the um, mural open so that people can come and have a look at it. But I'll lock it and just allow people to do comments. I think I can do that so that we Thanks. can all keep what we're doing. I think we'll need to do that anyway, because I, for some reason I can't see a chat. I don't know if it's because I'm not the chat owner or something, but I'll, I'll just send you the link. Chair. Yep, that's fine. And I'll put it, I'll put it up on the, up on the thing. Also, my apologies for slightly tweaking the agenda. As one of those things happens, you you start working through the agenda and discover that you have to tweak it very slightly. So how are we going for this one thing? Has everyone put in their one thing? I'd love to get one from everybody if I could. Could I ask you to create a box for me? Hello? Yes, certainly. Hello. Um, can we have an agreed standard for uh, reference street names, please, when we're doing our checks? Street names. Can yeah, you... what do you use as a standard by which to compare the street names that local authorities have used? To compare to local authorities. Yeah. Um, is this causing problems when you've got it comes up with false, street... false no, it comes up with false false tests. Passenger was uh, particularly good at producing false tests because they were using some free free mapping, which used one street name, and we had used that Staffordshire, um, the National Street Gazetteer, and we came up with a different mm. name. Right. And, and we had to spend a lot of time going through um, checking false false positives or negatives, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, it's just the nature, I, nature of the beast. But if we could have a best guess at what we would use as a reference tool, I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. And That's I've brilliant. used Thank Street you, Gazetteer as, as, as the best tool that I know. Um, it may not be free, yeah, but it's the, yeah. it's the best tool. Others may disagree. I'm like, I'm like what? Th let's what three words it and just create a whole new level of chaos up upon everything. But hmm. That's okay. Um, so let me just have a quick look at what we've got so far. I don't see quite enough. Oh, I see an agreed. I like I like agreed. So consult with LA's changes and to realize they are not the operators that and not the operators are the best independent providers of data. Uh, standardized bus stop names. Let's put that over here with that. I know that's slightly different, but that's about standardizing names. A reliable validation tool which allows for feedback and or suppression of false positives. 
uh, a data quality tool like ETO with pulse positive errors that could be suppressed. Um, validation against the NAT10 schema, but one that is easier to interpret. If it is hard to understand, it is more likely to be left ignored. I like that. Um, this, this is a big long one, so bear with me. Access to software that can adhere to NAP10 version 2.4 at least and create non-standard stops, e.g. flexi zones. This is not one thing, this is many things. Downstream systems that can import version 2.4 is most likely only except 2.1, making 2.4 mandatory like BODs. I believe NAT10 schema and process works well, but isn't utilizing it to its full potential. Local authorities have to find innovative bespoke solutions to problems in isolation to mitigate these problems as opposed to benefiting from what was already available in NAP10. Please keep Oto World available for local authorities. Okay. There's a lot to unpack in that one thing. Um, and I, I think there's two bits there, and I'm just going to unpack it very quickly. One is 2.4, and the other one is keeping Ito World. Does everyone agree that, that that effectively splits into two? Let's focus on making 2.4 the standard and keeping Ito World free. Um, from Kent County Council, we used to have an ICS system, but Traveline Southeast cancelled its delivery services in September, so have taken a step backwards. If we were to re-implement it, we could take the opportunity to overcome some of its shortcutting shortcomings. It could close stops, attach text messages to them, but could not change NAPTAN attributes, such as location for instance. This is because it was part of Traveline and not part of NAPTAN. Gotcha. So you could you could do everything but move the stop which you sometimes need to do. Is, did I interpret that right? Um, easy to use web uploader with integrated tool rather than fragmented and multiple channels. Live interconnectivity, re-incidents and bus stop alterations. A simple cost-effective transition from Ito world. Ask the people that do the job before drastically changing the system. Please do not keep on reinventing the wheel. I agree with the agreed. Um, and so, Th that has been really good. Does anyone have anything else to add to the one more things? As we were, oh, Mark. All I was going to say is don't forget stop areas when we're talking about NAPTAN. I'm not going to say any more, just don't forget them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will I will come and ask. I'm just gonna put a little Mark Taylor. Mark Taylor. I will I, I will probably send you some emails um with Corey and um Zoe and ask you some questions about that just to really understand what you mean so that we don't forget stop errors and we do them in a smart way. Um, so very quickly, I wanted to thank you all for your time, for your contributions, for your energy. This has been really great to get your feedback and I really appreciate your open and honest feedback. Um, we'll get this recording sent out. We'll get the deck sent out. I will keep the Miro board open for the rest of today so that you can put some more thoughts in. Um, and I'm just trying to think of anything else that we need. We're going to run probably another one, possibly early next year. And, and we'll be asking you some questions like, who wants to come and be part of a private beta? And who wants to be our test rabbits? Um, and things like that, because we want to show you what we've done and show you how we've been thinking and taking your feedback in and making stuff happen. Mark, you, you have a moment to say a last thing. Yeah, one last thing. I mean, with Ito disappearing at um, the end of December, I don't know, maybe somebody would like to put their hand in their pocket and keep it going while we have these discussions. That's something that we'd, we're definitely having discussions on. Yeah. Um, is there anything else? Anyone? Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything and your times. Thank you very much. Thanks for this.